On this show, we're driven by curiosity. We want to chart a path forward. Best people, best conversations. We're on a journey and it's just getting started. All right, everybody, we are back and we are live. I am Jack Murphy. This is the Jack Murphy Live Show. And today I've got a special returning guest, my favorite candidate for Congress from Washington State, the one and only Joe Kent. How are you doing today, sir? I'm doing great. Thanks for having me back on. Hey, it's my absolute pleasure to have you. I've been watching you since you came on the show a while back. I think it was right around the time you got your campaign kick-started. I was happy to have you on here and to get going talking about things. What's it been like on the campaign trail for the last few months, man? You've been grinding hard. We've been trying to put in the miles and put in the work. So I mean, it's actually been pretty motivating. You know, there was a lot to be depressed and down in the dumps about um, in 2020. So getting out, throwing my name in the hat to try and make a difference, and then going out and meeting like-minded patriots from across the district and then across the country has really been motivating because I think a lot of people right now are really hungry for a change. And, and just seeing the amount of, I think, political mobilization that's going on everywhere from school boards to community meetings to support the police rallies. I mean, we've just had a... Uh, a good outpouring here. And so it's, it's good to see. It gives me a lot of hope for the future. A lot of work to be done, but a lot of hope. Has anything sh like uh, been a surprise? You know, I have never been a candidate. I have never run for anything. I suspect it's probably not in my future. I look at what you guys go through and the process and all that. And it seems like a real grind. What has anything stood out to you, man? What has it been like? You know, you, you weren't a candidate and now all of a sudden you are, you're on your way to Congress, hopefully. I mean, that's a big change. Anything okay. stand out to you that was like uh, un unexpected? Yeah, you know, I mean, I kind of figured that there would be a lot of going out there and, and meeting people and, and kind of getting ground truth. I did a lot of that in my, my former life in the military and special operations. Um, so I kind of knew a lot of that was going to come, you know, with the job. Obviously, the financial stuff that comes along with it, having to raise money, I, I still think is a little bit awkward, kind of a pain, but we've been uh, pretty rewarded, I think, by the constituents and by people just, you know, being honest and genuine and saying, hey, I need money to, to tackle this. And people have rewarded me pretty, pretty well for that. And I, I'm grateful for it. Um, but really what I've found, I think the most interesting is just how much common... I would say common experience and just sentiment there is right now that we need to change our country and we need to have accountability from our institutions. So kind of like no matter where I go in the district or, or really throughout the country, I hear the same thing really from people that really should have very different life views because they're from, you know, different profession, different walk of life, socioeconomic class, but they're really all saying essentially the same thing that our government and our, you know, establishments at every level have failed us and they want to change it and they want to change it now. So that's actually... Sometimes you think, you know, hey, I'm the only crazy person that thinks all these things and maybe I'll listen to some podcasts or read some books, but maybe it's just me in this weird niche section of, of the Internet. But really, I mean, getting out and talking to regular people who don't live in that world every day, that is the sentiment of the average person. So it's uh, again, it's, it's, it's motivating to see. You said just now that in your prior work in special operations, you were out there doing similar stuff. Now that resonates with me and my understanding of the way that we try to handle business on the ground in the Middle East, but maybe you could explain a little bit to the people what you mean by that. Yeah, so I was in the military for a little over 20 years in the intelligence community uh, after that. It was a Green Beret for most of it. Started out in Ranger Regiment uh, before 9-11, very kind of direct action, what you think of when you think of special ops guys kicking in doors and, and shooting bad guys and all that. Green Berets is a little bit of a combination of both. So you're supposed to be a, a regional expert in the culture and the language of region of the world. I was a fifth group guy, so middle of the Middle East was my, my neck of the woods. Spent a lot of time in Iraq, a lot of time. Uh, building militias, building armies, and then training them, but then also getting ground truth. And that, that's key. That's kind of what sets special forces apart is that we can, we can go out and we can collect our own intelligence, come up with our own influence agents in, a, in an area, and then you know, go do everything from kinetics types of missions to uh, you know, influence, putting in people into, into different parts of the government, building militias, building militaries. So I kind of view this as, as it's very similar. I go to different parts of my district. I meet with key leaders. We try and come up with a plan on essentially how we're going to take our country back, because I think we have to have an insurgent mindset right now at this, at this point in the game. Interesting. That's exactly where I was going with that. Uh, you were, we have to have an insurgent mindset. 
we are sort of occupied by uh, what Darren Beatty calls the uh, globalist American empire. Uh, and it's a it, term. It, is a, it is a great term. You can use the acronym if you like. Uh, it, uh, it strikes me that, you know, the government has been co-opted and we know this. We know that the media, the corporations, all the institutions have been co-opted. And here we are, like Americans in America as insurgents. That's such a crazy kind of thing to say. Uh, before the show, you and I were talking about the relevance of fourth generation warfare here, which is basically the main premise is that nation state power is waning. It is the power of gangs, factions, ideas, causes, corporations, et cetera, that are growing in power. So much so that I think I saw someone non-ironically uh, write on Bloomberg the other day that Facebook should get a seat at the United Nations. I mean, how can we take these lessons? You know, what I'm talking about here in terms of insurgency and ideas and causes and stuff, I got directly from the fourth generation warfare literature you lived it on the ground on the ground uh is there a place for that type of thinking here in the united states right now how how, how do we move forward with that as a mind frame or mindset i mean i think to really survive and not just kind of crawl into a into a dark hole of despair you kind of have to be yourself as an insurgent but really that's that's our heritage as americans that's how that's why we are a country because at one point we said hey we're not going to live under the crown, which at the time was a very globalist empire onto itself that had its own corporate wing, it had its own landed aristocracy. And if you look at the way things are right now in America, we're definitely already there or heading really in that direction, but on a much, much faster scale because of, you know, technology and all that. But, you know, what I, what I saw and what I lived in the, in the Middle East, the way that uh, these insurgent movements were able to build and endure the, um, the full scope of U.S., the, the global superpower at the time, our, of our power, they were able to do it because they were just in every single level. They knew the population. They knew the ground truth. They knew where all the levers to flip in the economy were, how to get people out on the streets. They knew all these very different things. And so I think we have to, we in the conservative movement, the America First movement, whatever we want to call ourselves, those of us that dissent from the current regime, which I think it can be a very big tent, um, we have to get out there and we have to build these networks of resistance against the gangs that are being thrown against us on the street level and then against this global uh, tyranny of corporations um, that's really usurping the nation state right now. Yeah, that's a fascinating perspective. It's at once troubling, very, very troubling. Uh, on the other hand, it's also sort of motivating, inspiring to note that it's sort of sort of in our blood. Uh, and, you know, to be dissident and to be insurgent in many respects. Uh, I struggle with just accepting almost the reality that ideas and causes and gangs and corporations are going to be more powerful or already are more powerful than the nation state. And then when you combine it with the idea that like uh, Marshall McLuhan predicted that the you know Third World War would know no distinction between civilian and, and combatant, You've got social media reach into all of our brains, literally changing our brain chemistry every single day. Uh, the the blurring of media and war, uh, it really takes a new perspective to understand. I mean, guys like Mitch McConnell, for example, no clue about any of this stuff, right? And I don't even know what he's doing up there in the Senate. But are there any other folks that you have seen that, that have adopted or have come to see the truth of this perspective and and are synthesizing it in a way where uh, you can decide, I think, to become a reformer or a revolutionary. And I guess by running for Congress, you're definitely going the reformer route. But have you found anybody else that has that sees the world in this same way? And I'm going to dovetail that with the, the next question that I had, which was like, have you found any unlikely allies as we try to expand this tent? So start with the first and then end up with the second there. You know, I think, you know, folks that are already in government, there, there's there's a few. I mean, there's not as many as there need to be. And, and I think that in this, this election cycle, probably between 22 and 24, we're going to have to really cast away or change or persuade a lot of people away from the conventional thinking of i'm a republican so therefore i believe 
in these couple core Reagan Reaganomic type of uh, doctrines, and any deviation from that is socialism, and I will be cast out as a leper. I think we're gonna have to fight a lot of that, and we can kind of get into what what some of those details are, because I think that's the way that we actually fight against the globalist corporations, the globalist uh, oligarchy, because the only thing that could really beat them is the nation state. Actually, is America is being nationalist. Um, and to you know dovetail into your your next question about unlikely allies, I I do think we have a good potential for a lot of allies. There are people on the left, and people don't like it when I say this, on the left, on the populist left, some of your like original Bernie bros, some of the anti-corporatists, um, and there's still a few of them out there. Like the, the left with the woke culture, they did a great job of co-opting and really taking all the fight out of that movement and turning it into this social justice crusade, which I think really has kind of met their mission. They, they've made it this social justice crusade, which now has now is deconstructing everything from the family unit to the sovereign nation state. But what did it do? It stopped looking at the corporate oligarchy, you know, but there are still a few folks out there on the left um, who I think if we, we let them know there's room for them in our movement, that we can bring them over to our side and they can be part of this, this nationalist populist uh, revival that's going to save our nation and eventually beat the oligarchy. It's interest it's interesting to me uh to hear you say that the the answer to the 4G conflict is more powerful American nation state. Uh I like that consideration. The problem is is uh who's in charge of the American nation state right now? It is the globalist that's, American that's Empire. That's why I run it for Congress, because we gotta take it back. <laughs> yeah, we definitely have to take it back. Now there are people on the left that I can think of right away who would fit in with this message. A, a, a Matt Stoller comes to mind immediately. Uh, he's been a Democrat, he's worked in several different administrations, but the guy is a true populist. He really understands antitrust and how we should be wielding that power. So I implore anybody on the right who thinks like us uh, to reach out to somebody like Matt and try to bring him in. And, and I know that it's really tough for him because, uh, you know, if he even talks to somebody like me, uh, it gives him a whole bunch of problems on the left there. Um, how, how do we bring those people over from that side? What is the messaging that we give to people on the left, the populist left, that at once gets them to change, but then also, you know, in doing so, we have to make it safe for them to arrive on this side. So how do, how do we reach out and make that happen? I think really pointing out what the true enemy is, it's really easy to get stuck in these uh, these partisan fistfights. And I say that as a guy who's running as a, you know, Trump endorsed America first candidate. But it's really easy to get in these partisan knife fights where we're like, oh, the liberals are screwing this up and I just want to dunk on the libs and own the libs. I mean, I really do think things are so dire right now that it's it's us that want freedom, that want to build a strong America for the American people versus the corporatists and the global oligarchy that, you know, they want complete and total control of your life. So I think staying consistent on those messages and being more welcoming, because like you said, there's a few folks on the left that if they do, they, if they come, if they come on, uh, on your show, <laughs> they're going to be canceled and eaten alive by their own. I mean, if you look at the way that I think, uh, the formation that uh, Glenn Greenwald's gone through, I don't think he's changed at all. I think the left has really changed with him and they've been absolutely horrible to him. However, he gets a seat on Tucker Carlson because he's got interesting, relevant things to say. And those of us on the right were like, yeah, okay, I, I want to hear what Glenn Greenwald has to say, you know, because he's actually, he's got some great insights. So let's just be, you know, welcoming and inviting. And I think especially with a lot of the, uh, the populist economics folks uh, on the left, because if we just point out what we have in common and our overall goal is to do the right thing by the American people, there's going to be some social issues that we just flat out disagree on. And we can disagree on those later, but let's absolutely neuter the corporate oligarchy first. And then let's have those discussions once we, you know, we know that we can work together. Yeah. Uh, I, I made a political transformation, so I am not opposed to people making political transformations. When people give me crap about having J.D. Vance on being like, oh, he's a never Trumper. I'm like, man. I voted for Obama. <laughs> like I wrote a book on political transformation. It's called Democrat to deplorable. You guys should check it out. And part of the goal that I had in doing that was creating space for people like me to land on this side of the wall. 
Uh, you know, at first you think if you're on the left, you think that everybody on the right is a racist or a Nazi or some terrible, horrible person. But when you finally like actually break bread and drink wine with these people, with the us people, with our people, you realize that we're all actually just Americans believing in the American founding, believing in the Constitution, freedom of speech, freedom of association, all those kind of things. Wow. A powerful legislature. Oh, you know, no executive orders, that kind of stuff. It's really, it's really basic meat and potatoes. Uh, but you know, the left does such a very good job of characterizing us as terrible people. Just a small personal story real quick. I got docs in 2018 and there was a girl from my past who was like involved in all that. She knew me in my past as a quote rave DJ, right? I was an underground house DJ. And uh, there was just an article put out to me about me today about how I'm a white supremacist and whatever. And she says, you know, the world was a better place when Jack was just a house DJ and a white supremacist. And I'm like, you know what? I did not change. I didn't change at all. The world is careening hard to the left. And we saw in 2016 people like my buddy Tim Poole opposed to Tim, uh, Donald Trump. Like guys like James Lindsay opposed to Donald Trump. But then as the reality just starts to hammer home over the hit them over the head over and over again, 2020, both of them were on on our side. I think there's more of those people coming. Do you see any of that where you are in your district? Do you see people abandoning the left and, and being open minded? Maybe not to GOP, right? Because GOP is like our first our first target here. Uh, but, uh, you know, just to the America first, you know, uh, ideas that you're putting forth. Do you know, and um, for for folks that are willing to come out and have the conversation, I feel like I I think me and my supporters have been fairly successful at bringing some people over the school boards and what's going on in the school system, and then the COVID lockdown issue has been this great bridging opportunity because there's all kinds of folks that either for whatever reason MAGA Donald Trump just like made the hairs on the back of their neck stand up and they for whatever for whatever reason didn't like it. Or a lot of them just were so soured on politics. They're like, yeah, man, I deleted Facebook. I, I don't even want to hear about it. But now it's right up here in my face. I'm going to get fired if I don't get the jab. My, my kid's being taught that he's evil uh, because he's white and America's systemically racist. And so I see it's coming for me. Like, what, what do you guys have to say? And I think welcoming them with, with open arms and saying, hey, we actually want the same things that, that you guys do, I think has actually been, uh, it's been pretty successful. You know, I, I think... Um, there's a lot of folks that have even told me that they either didn't vote in, in 2020 or that, you know, they, they voted for Biden and now they regret it. Um, we've also out in this district, too, we, we have a lot of uh, former Bernie Sanders supporters that were very, very much opposed to everything that Joe Biden and Hillary Clinton stood for. Um, and so they feel like the DNC really messed them over for whatever reason. They couldn't fully get behind Trump, but now they're really starting to come around. And again, when we start talking about, you know, power to the people, you know, populist economics, how we're going to save the country, they're all in, you know, like I so said, I think they're still a little bit wary about America first because they're afraid someone's going to call them a fascist for saying America first. But when, I, when we explain that, hey, this is this is our country. This is our sovereign nation state. This is the only thing that's going to pull us through this, because if we don't, the corporations are literally going to take everything over and turn us into you know debt slaves or serfs, however you want to look at it. Then they start to come around a little more. Yeah, I think the anti-corporate message is a strong one. Uh, antitrust message is a strong one. Uh, we have to stop. There's got to be a whole new mindset in the GOP. And we're really we're actually trying to defeat the GOP establishment and then and then get in. Like, as Pedro Gonzalez said the other day, you can't fight the Democrats until you fight the Republicans first. Uh, I do. I do believe that guys like Mitch McConnell are in our way. They're not helping by any means. Uh, you know, the legislature has given up all of its authority and its and, it, and its relevance over the last number of years to where now the the administrative state makes makes law by rule. And then the judiciary uh, judges, you know, uh, makes a ruling on that and confirms it. And it's all outside of the hands of the legislature. Uh, I have big, dis big disappointments in the legislature. I'm really hoping that you can bring some power back uh, to the to the House and, and hopefully to Congress in general. But speaking of overreach speaking of insanity speaking of people taking the domestic no the international war on terror lessons that you and i have been talking about from the other side uh, from the insurgent side we're now seeing what i and others have predicted for years now especially uh with joe biden coming into office and the and the way that uh, they they've been using january 6th 
as as that pivot point to take all of their counterinsurgency efforts, mind frame, powers, tools, and everything that they learned, refined, practiced, mastered uh, in the Mideast, and then just turning that whole apparatus over here to the United States, redefining oh, yeah. what it means to be a terrorist, redefining what it means to be a, a white supremacist, <laughs> right? As Biden said, uh, uh, white supremacy terror is the number one threat facing us in America today. He said this to the joint session of Congress in his very first address as the president. What do you make of the recent statements from Merrick Garland and the Department of Justice and their intention now? to begin maybe prosecuting, attacking, arresting? What are they going to do to dissenting parents who don't believe that critical race theory should be taught in schools? What do you make of this recent position that they just came out with? And, uh, you know, tell us what we're going to do about it. I mean, they're obviously trying to intimidate. They like everything I just mentioned, how we have these great bridge issues of CRT, what's going on with the schools what's going on with the COVID, that has the left or the Biden regime, however you want to look at it, that has them very scared because they see that we're going to have this massive groundswell of support. So what do they want to do? They want to nip it in the bud. And they've been very successful between their allies and the media and then what you outlined in the national security state, how now the national security state does not any longer have a target overseas necessarily. There's still some, but the Biden regime is way more focused on internal. They're, they're, they're shifting that focus now onto people that dissent from the current regime. And really the January 6th narrative gave them a great test run. They were able to take one incident that day, be completely and totally unhonest, un dishonest with it. They've had the media help them every se step of the way saying like, okay, the, the Trump supporters beat to death a police officer with a fire extinguisher. That was the common narrative until it was actually formally debunked by Darren Beatty. Um, and then they haven't obviously been honest about how much infiltration they had. We can get into all that, but the way they've been able to weaponize the January 6th narrative, it's been very sticky and like they have not really been checked. We still have political prisoners that have been detained without due process. That's still ongoing. And so now, because they didn't receive any pushback from that, none of them have been held accountable for all of that. That's still ongoing. Now they say, okay, let's nip this school board issues in the bud. They had the, whatever, the national teachers union folks who we know are dishonest actors based on the way that they've held our kids hostage with these COVID, with the COVID crisis, um, had them write a letter saying they feel very threatened by the potential of violence and, and potential terrorism at these school board meetings. And then what, a week later, AG Garland's there saying, well, it sounds like these guys could really be domestic terrorists, which is very key language. I mean, in, in one hand, you want to laugh at it, but when the AG is saying that, hey, you could be a domestic terrorist just for showing up to your kid's school board meeting and saying, hey, I have some issues that I would like to discuss with you, that that could get you labeled. And that all the ramifications that comes with from more surveillance being put on you to, are you going to get a knock on your door and, and be detained and now have your due process taken away from you? Like a year ago, that would have sounded obscene for me to say that it's been kind of a ridiculous, you're a conspiracy theorist. But look at what happened with the people that were in or around the Capitol on January 6th. The government's done this. The government is in the process of getting away with it. And now they're just shifting that uh, that label of domestic terrorists onto the next threat to, um, I guess, their their popular support. And they, they want to nip this in the bud going into the 22 midterms. Am I right to think that middle American, middle-aged white women who oppose critical race theory in their schools, 45 year old Mary with three kids from Oklahoma is now considered or will be a domestic terrorist by our department of justice who are expert in detaining people illegally and torturing people around the world and killing and murdering and all these horrible things. Mary from Oklahoma is now on the list because she doesn't want to be told that her or she doesn't want her six year old daughter to be told that she is part of a white supremacy culture and must stand aside for people of color. Is that where we are, dude? That, that's where we're at. And, and that's because we didn't check the fact that, that Mary's Mary's mother, somebody's grandmother who was near the Capitol on January 6th wearing a MAGA hat had the FBI kick in their door you know, and, and take their electronic devices like that basically went unchecked. There's there's some folks out there that are pushing back against it, but they're in the minority. They're being labeled as white supremacists, domestic terrorists or whatever, too. And so that's 
that's where this is heading. I mean, the regime right now will not tolerate any dissent whatsoever. And that's that's the clear message right now. And I think they're they're going to try to between the vaccine you know, mandates, which people are losing their jobs over. And then this level, I really think they're just seeing how much people can take until they either comply or they do something stupid. A lot of this has to do. I think a lot of this is to provoke a reaction to get somebody who's at their wits end to do something really dumb and then be able to absolutely hammer them and use them as an example as to why we need this enhanced surveillance, this enhanced security state protecting the American people. You you said a minute ago that if we had said this a year ago, it would have sounded obscene or absurd. Uh, I, I feel like every year I'm saying the same thing about things that we once thought were conspiracy, yeah. things that I thought were fringe are no longer fringe. People called me fringe years ago. Now everything that we talked about is actually coming true. I, I once wrote about how the left wants to sterilize your boys in the future. It's coming. And people thought I was insane. And now a guy on the Pennsylvania state legislature just introduced a bill, or at least said he was going to introduce a bill that would have been forced sterilization of men over 40 or men who have had three kids, whichever comes first. I thought that was a joke. It's not a joke. Have you, yeah. have, have you seen anything, any reason for us to think that somebody somewhere in the regime, not you, not an outsider, not a reformer, not a reactionary, not a revolution, is somebody inside going to put their foot on the brakes and slow this thing down? I don't think so. I said a year ago, maybe, that w that unfortunately, we seem to be waiting on someone on the left to be like, whoa, 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 we can't just kill them. Right. Like, yeah. it, do you see any sign of it slowing down or should we just take this latest um, um, attack or, or at least the, the statement of future attack coming on Mary from Oklahoma? Is, is there any we, we just put this one more in the trend? Right. And so we can draw this line and see where it's going and, and have to take action back based on that. Anything slowing it down at all, Joe? I really don't think so. I mean, there's a couple of people that are on the right that are in in the system, so to speak, that are fighting for us, I, I do feel. But expecting the other side to say, wait a sec, this is just too much, guys. I can't go along with this. I think we've seen what happens with those people. Like, where's Tulsi Gabbard? I, and that's not a ding on Tulsi. I, I, I actually really like her. But she went after, she went internal and said, hey, I'm going after all the corruption on this side. And I don't know what they did to her. I don't know what the backstory is. I can't pretend I've never spoken to her in my life. We don't hear from her, from her anymore, you know. Um, and there's been a few other examples like that. And then Bernie, they essentially bought him out, or or whatever they did with him. So we obviously can't expect it to happen from the left. And then the right, like you said, we have to we have to really take out the GOP first and make that party our own and make them actually do the right thing. But even the folks that I feel that are on the right, that are in the system, that are fighting for us, the the establishment does so much to just try and take away their voice. Look at Marjorie Taylor Greene. Look at Matt Gates. I mean, there was nobody on the right when they were coming after Matt Gates, and, and they have all these crazy accusations that have now been totally debunked. It, the guy was being extorted. There was very few people on the actual establishment right that were like, "Hey, Matt Gates, you can you can come to CPAC." They tried to kick. I was there. They tried to kick the guy out of CPAC. I mean, Matt Brainerd held an event for Matt Gates, but you know, Gates wasn't allowed in the actual tent there. You know, and then same thing, Marjorie Taylor Greene. Multiple Republicans voted to kick her off of all of her committees. She's made, she's plotted her own way because she's a great fighter. You know, we get Paul Gosar's in there usually swinging away at things, but the, the few that are fighting for us on the right, like they need backup again. That's, that's why I'm running for Congress. Um, but I, I think really what people have to realize that it's on us. Like there's, there's nobody coming. Um, there's no plan to trust. Like we actually have to do the work. We have to get out there and grind. We have to build our own social networks and we have to do the really unsexy things like register people to vote and get out and vote. No matter how hopeless you think it is, if you're not out there registering people to vote and you're not out there voting, then you, you, you have become the black pill, you know, like there, there is no hope then. So I think that's, that's the big, that's the biggest message I have is that, Hey, it, it's on us, man. There's no backup. It is on us. There's no backup. No one's coming to save us. We have to do this together. Uh, and there's no counting on the, quote, pendulum of history. Okay. My, my mom always says this to me. 
Uh, she's one of the few people from my family that still engages with me on a, on, on a genuine level on these issues. Most of my family's real leftist, crazy feminist children of the 60s. They still think feminism is about getting women the right to have a checkbook. I mean, I can't, I don't, I, I'm at my wits end with them. There's no, there's no convincing them at this point. But my mom always says, it'll just work out in the end. The pendulum will swing back. The overreach yes. will happen and it'll just swing back. And I said, mom. That may be true on a macro level. If you're reading about history in a hundred years, you'll look back and you'll be like, oh, the pendulum swung, it swung back the other way. But right now, today, we need people to take action. We need to do things. All that pendulum swinging, all this working itself out in the end stuff is just the end result of countless people making changes on the margin which is what I'm trying to do here with my media outreach and the liminal order and working with men all across the country. And that's what you're doing here by trying to run, well, by running and winning your seat in Congress and then hopefully winning re-election a number of times after that, unless you get bumped up the food chain, boss, because I could see that coming for you as well. Um, you got to get out there and do stuff. There's no time for black pilling here, right? Uh, people... People who take the black pill and choose to check out of this altogether aren't helping. They're actually hurting. Uh, what do you say to the black pillars? What is your sliver of hope? What is the thing that you hang on to to move yourself forward? What is the goal, the vision? What is your why, as the personal coaches <laughs> like to ask? How, how do we convince people not to be black pilled and what hope do we give them, Joe? I mean, my, my why I think might seem a little cliche, but I mean, this is the country that I fought for. This is a country countless of my friends fought for and died for. My late wife gave her life for this country. So for me, my why is like, I have no other choice. This is this is it for me. And I think this is it for our kids. I think this is it for our future period. And if you look at the history of the world, you do the big zoom out. And if you're going to get black pilled on America, then wait till you learn about the rest of the countries and the rest of the history of the world and the rest of humanity, because it's pretty horrible. America has been like the last America has been the only great hope for the world. If we fail, the whole the whole thing really fails. And I, and I truly believe that. So that's my my big why. What I would say to a lot of the black pill folks, because I think a lot of the black pill folks like to be contrarian or whatever. But I say, if you take the black pill, you've done exactly what the left wants you to do. Like you, you want to say that we're suckers for still believing, man, you, you took it hook, line and sinker because the left wants you, they want you to do something stupid or they want you to just crawl off into your cave somewhere and, and post on 4chan and be angry on the internet. That's exactly what they want you to do. So that, I mean, that's, that's overall my, my, Hey, like you can't let them win, man. Even if, even if in your, in your heart, you're like, maybe it's all hopeless. Don't give them that. Just keep fighting, you know, one one foot in front of the other. Like I've gotten through a lot of hard times in my life because I was like, well, I'm not going to let this break me. Um, and then you come out on the other end from it. And I, I think that's a that's a big reason. There's the there's the big hope of like saving America and apple pie and, and all that type of stuff. And that does it for some people. Uh, but for a lot of other people, like don't give them the win. Don't let Zuckerberg of all people, you know, and the rest of these clowns, Jack Dorsey, like don't let them be the ones that psyoped you into thinking there's no hope. Yeah. Uh, Jennifer Law, thank you so much for the support in the chats, uh, Ceci, also. Uh, I had Blake Masters on. Blake Masters, of course, the, the co-author of Zero to One with Peter Thiel, uh, head of uh, the Peter Thiel Foundation, COO at Thiel Capital, and Senate candidate from Arizona. And I asked him the Teal contrarian question, right? Apparently, Peter Teal loves to ask uh, interviewees and people, you know, what is the one opinion that you hold that everybody thinks is crazy? And uh, I asked, uh, I asked Blake that, and his response, uh, he, well, first he goes, "That's a great question," and then the second thing he said was, uh, "I'm white pilled. I'm white pilled. Uh, I am not a black pilled person. There's a lot of black pilled people around us." Uh, but uh, I think that I can, I can, uh, it res that sentiment resonates with me. There's so many positive things that are happening in the world right now in technology and among our communities and among our people. And there are avenues towards success and there are avenues towards victory. 
It's just going to take a lot of time and energy and hard work and blood, sweat and tears and nothing good ever comes easy. And so we have to hang on to that hope. And I believe that we have the tools, we have the power, we have the technology to find a, a way to build competing networks that, that, that replace the captured and corrupted institutions uh, and to find a place to make meaning and value and economic and financial security for, our, for people that see the world the same way. And uh, that's technology. That's, that's both bringing the hammer and giving us an out there. I'm going to use this as a way to, to make a, a transition, though. We're talking about tech, talking about Blake, talk to him about technology. Uh, what do you think about this latest you know, thing with the Facebook, quote, whistleblower, uh, who really is just coming out and saying that Facebook doesn't censor people enough? Uh, what what do we do about the big tech? What is your concrete, hard plan? Not just, oh, we got to do something about big tech. What are the very specific concrete te- uh, steps we're going to take to battle big tech and what they're doing? So, I mean, usually the, the Facebook whistleblower is like, they're not even trying anymore, maybe with the psyops. Like, I, I just have a really hard time believing that the whistleblower is like, guys, it turns out we're going to need more censorship on Facebook. Facebook doesn't want me to tell you that. Like, it it almost seemed a little little, little bit too set up. They, they could have thought that one through a little bit better. <laughs> um, but with, with big tech, like, I am an advocate of not just breaking up big tech, but, you know, seizing big tech's assets, making it a public utility. Like, they are, I think we need to use antitrust law to go after that. I'm trying to get as smart as I can on antitrust law right now. Um, I like the Section 230 reform, completely getting rid of Section 230. I, I almost think, though, it, it misses the point. Like, let's just seize it. It's an eminent domain at this point. So it's the same concept to me as when, you know, your city's growing, your urban area is growing, and the government comes and says, like, hey, I'm really sorry, but we have to build a road through your house. We're going to reimburse you for it. But we're building a road through the house to move commerce along. Uh, I think it's the same thing, really. I mean, the, the amount of control and power that the tech oligarchs have right now. And there's so few of them. I mean, Zuckerberg, like yesterday, I mean, how many different apps went down because Facebook crashed? It's pretty crazy to see in real time. And then on the other hand, you got Twitter. Everyone knows all the First Amendment issues. I think the First Amendment issues really, as horrible as they are, they just start to scratch the surface of how much control these handful of people have over our lives. And you really can't run from the fact or hide from the fact that these these tech oligarchs, these technocrats, like they do not want what's best for the nation state. And this is where I run. This is where we have to do a lot of uh, a lot of, I guess, educating with some of the the older conservatives and Republicans. This is where you do have to have a strong nationalist policy that gets in the way of the free market and says, like, a company or a corporation will not have dominance and will not have privacy over our sovereign nation state. Sorry, end of story. So break, breaking them up and seizing their assets and treating them as public utilities, that's that's my plan. That's what I want to do. I love to hear it. I love to hear that. Classifying them as a common carrier is one approach. Blake Masters was definitely yeah. an advocate of that. Uh, I loved hearing what J.D. Vance had to say uh, about uh, uh, school endowments, university endowments and such. He's like, seize the assets. And people in the comments and, and, and the feedback afterwards were like, what is this fascist craziness? And I was like, bro, bro, they're actually just talking about taxes. You ever heard about taxes? Like that, right. taxes, that's, yeah. that's one good way to seize people's assets. I mean, it happens to me every April 15th. I get my assets seized by the federal government. <laughs> yeah. I think we can figure yeah. out a way to seize some assets from, you know, quadrillionaire Harvard endowments or the Ford Foundation or these other people that get mm-hmm. this tax-free money with which to wage a war on the American people. Yeah. Uh, it, it's certainly an interesting evolution uh, on the right. I, I went through, in the past, I went through a, a militant atheist cringe phase, which I've no longer uh, can cl- lay claim to, thank God. Uh, I've also can uh, went through a cringy libertarian phase. Uh, I did go to George Mason University and studied economics there, so I didn't have much of a choice. But... It's fascinating to see evolution in myself and in others that what free markets are not the end all be all. Free markets are not a religion. Free markets are not going to bring us salvation. Free markets do not uh, extol virtue. Free markets do not look out for people. And you know what? We need to look out for people first. We don't need to look out for free markets first. And uh, I can hear in my head the critique that comes from the people at Reason. They call us uh, MAGA socialists, which I think is a very funny thing because 
It doesn't mean that I've we want to, that. Yeah. yeah, it doesn't mean we want to redistribute assets. No, what it means is that we want to actually use the state to do things that benefit the people of the United States of America. And that idea, that framework is, is I think one of the avenues by which we can get people on the left, Matt Stoller, if anybody's listening, Matt Stoller, please reach out to these guys because I know that Matt sees the world very similarly. Um, it's fascinating this evolution from libertarian to using the state capacity to affect the right outcomes. So Blake masters, you JD all coming to similar conclusions. I like that. Um, you also had something where you mentioned uh, recently about China, China buying up land in the United States, and you've come out just directly point blank and said, end foreign ownership of American real estate. Now, I want to ask you a question, but let me set it up for a sec. In the 80s, I remember, I may be older than you, Joe, just a smidge maybe, uh, but I do remember in the 80s, the big fear was Japan was buying up all the real estate. They had bought Rockefeller Center. They had bought some, I can't remember the name of the yeah. golf course in Carmel. That was like a big deal that they bought. And it really impacted Donald Trump's perception of world trade, right? Because he was a real estate guy in New York in the 80s, watching the Japanese come, use their, you know, their protected industries to, to, to stockpile cash, come to the United States, buy up all of our key assets and such. Now, there was a fear that they were taking over, Japan taking over. Uh, that didn't necessarily come to fruition. But we do see now China doing very much the same thing, which is being a mercantilist, setting up their economy to benefit their state first, right? Not to benefit free markets, not to benefit particular corporations, but to benefit the state first. Then they capture, they capture all of our USD. What are they going to do with it? They turn around and they buy up assets, productive farmland, national security type assets in the United States. Tell me what your thoughts are on the Chinese buying the farms and articulate your position on the real estate uh, holdings by foreign entities. And uh, what do we do about that? Yeah, I mean, I think it's pretty simple. Like we're going to see what, what China, we can see what China's going to do with this, this farmland. I mean, they're going to take it up. It's a very valuable resource. They're going to take that and they are going to use it for their, their own benefit. They're going to sell us back food, food staples grown on our land at an exorbitant price, or they're going to export it and they're going to sell it for way more money. Because like you said, they're a mercantilistic gangster capitalist uh, country. I mean, they call themselves communists, I guess, but they're really like communists in the way they deal with their own people. They're, they're about as capitalist as the drug cartel is when it comes to their own trade. And so I, I, I think it's absolutely absurd that we're letting our number one geostrategic foe, China, who is at, at war with us, they're waging an economic and information war with us, that we're letting them buy up our land because somewhere some free market person just said, hey, whatever the market will bear, I mean, like if China can outbid, you know, an American for a piece of land, then the market says that the guy with the most money gets the land, right? Like, no, that that's not how sovereign nation states do business. Like no other serious nation in the world is gonna let you and I sail over to their country and just start buying up their farmland. It's, it's, it's completely absurd, you know, especially with a country like China. So, I mean, I, I, I am, we should end foreign land ownership period because we're a serious country. And there's, if there's land in our country, it needs to benefit our people. If that means that the, the price of that land goes down and whoever currently owns it, they don't get as much money as they would from a Chinese mega corporation or a Chinese investor, then so be it. I, I really, I don't care about that at all. I care about what happens with that piece of America it benefiting Americans. Yeah, this is part of eradicating the globalist mindset that had been inputted into all of our brains throughout the 90s, right? Uh, yep. There's some idea that if we just open up all of our borders, both for immigrants, both for capital and money, both for corporations and investment, foreign direct investment, that all these things are going to benefit the, the American people somehow. Uh, I don't understand how allowing foreigners to use the United States real estate market as a bank, basically, uh, in some respects, like, like New York, San Fran, Miami real estate is so grossly distorted by people who are just taking their cash from overseas and parking it in U.S. real estate and bidding prices up and sometimes not even occupying it, right? Uh, I don't see how that benefits us in the long run. And I certainly don't understand how selling off strategic assets to foreign countries, especially ones that hate us, 
especially the ones that hold 100 and 200 and 500 year grudges, especially ones that are still upset about the opium wars and blame us in England for that, who are still 100 years later pumping us full of opiates in a response. People forget this, dude. This is their response to the opium wars, dumping and flooding our country with fentanyl in very much the same way we did the same thing to them 100 years ago, that we should let those people buy up food producing assets in the United States of America when we've already shipped off overseas our insulin production, our fine tool machinery production, all kinds of parts of our manufacturing chain. If COVID didn't highlight to us the dangers that we have in our supply chain on a national security level, I don't know what is. Maybe it's an army of the up of uh, of um, diabetics in America not getting their insulin and dying that would make people like actually wake up to understand uh, what has happened. So, Joe, it sounds crazy, dude, when you're like, hey, oh, nobody can buy these people can't buy any land. It sounds extreme, but you know, the regular people. Like, how how do we get it taught in the schools? How do we promote this, you know, nationalist, which not not jingoist, not military dictatorship, not go invade Canada and Mexico after this because go America. But like nationalist to me means the first job of the government is to take care of the people. That's right. How do we spread that message? I think starting with the, you know, the, the starting principles of, hey, why do we have a government? Like, what's the history of governments? Why do people organize themselves in this way? You know, as deep as you want to go, you can geek out in, on it and, and get back into the, you know, the, the Westphalian uh, Treaty and all that and the formation of nation states. But really getting into, hey, why did our founders make our country? Like, where, where was the world at then? I mean, we talked about it earlier, like we didn't want to be ruled by the monarchy. We didn't want to be ruled by essentially the global, the globalist power that was Great Britain at the time. We said, hey, we want to be independent people. We want to create a government that just secures the God-given rights that we know that men have. And, and there's something very powerful and very beautiful in all that. And I think if we return to that, we don't shy away from it. We accept it warts and all. Yes, at the time, did we recognize all men? No, there was slavery then. And then we fought an entire war in, in 60,000 People died uh, in one battle over the course of a couple of days in Pennsylvania and like learn, learn about all that and embrace it, but know that that's our heritage and that's what we're striving for. And then keep, you know, keep people's attention long enough to say where we got off the rails was we started doing things according to what was just best for the economy and what effect did that have on our country? We started shipping these jobs overseas. There's an economic issue. There's a national security supply chain issue. Then there's a social issue. Like people do need to work and not everybody can go be a computer programmer. Like people need to work and they need to build things or something inherently good and, and young men in particular, being able to go and to build things and to provide for their family. Without that, society's completely and totally collapsed. I think we have to embrace that. I think as uh, our grandparents' generation is, is dying off, you know, pretty quickly, um, the GI generation that won World War II, what, what made them win World War II? We always think of the guys hitting the beaches, and as a former soldier, I do too, of guys out there engaged in hand-to-hand -hand combat against, you know, Nazis and Imperial Japan. But really, the country decided that, hey, we aren't going to take this. We're going to push back, and we're actually going to go, and, and we're going to save the world. We got to the war reluctantly, but we took industry. We took GM. We took these amazing American manufacturing companies, and we flipped them on a dime, and this is you know, decades ago, we flipped them on a dime from building cars and building appliances to building bombers and to building munitions. And that was because the country wanted to win. We had that common purpose. And I think we have to reinstate that. And I think we're going to have to discipline and rein in our elites because our elites are not in on that program right now whatsoever. We're going to have to go after them first, but then we're going to have to have great American rule of manufacturing of our natural resources industries, but making sure that your average everyday American is seeing that and you know the the trump economic policies that's what that's why we saw rate wages rise between 17 and 20 in 2019 was this amazing year for working class people and we saw all that growth because that when you when you got rid of all of the uh the hype around trump and all the all of the you know the media attacks really what he was trying to do was bring back our manufacturing base you know that was that was so much part of his message and that's why he resonated in all these different places where republicans had just really not been able to captivate people's attention for so long because Republicans would come and say like, well, trickle down economics says that we just need to make things really good for the guys at the top and it will eventually trickle down to you because the guys at the top will want to buy more stuff. 
you know, but then Trump came in and said, no, I want to bring back American, American manufacturing. I want us to build and produce again. I think that has to be, that has to be the message. So the, the starting place of our history, but then getting towards, Hey, what's the goal? What's this for? We're a sovereign nation that care deeply about our people. We're not just an economy. And I think we'll bring over people from the left with that message too. I love it. I, I, I think you're absolutely right. I am, I am nervous though. I'm a little skeptical because Let's go back to World War II example. Uh, it was easy to rally America on a common message because there was really only a handful of ways to communicate to the American people. And so if you had the media and the newspapers just align in their message for better or for worse, in this case, it was for better, right? rallying American people, urging industry to make the changes, whether, I don't know if it was compelled by law or not, it may have been, but at least getting public support behind it, right? And orienting the people towards this greater cause came through very concrete messaging, came through controlling the message and, and, and creating resonance in America. What we don't have today is resonance. And that is because of social media. And that is because of, the, of this. We actually don't have that resonance for better or worse again, uh, because the, instead of one talking to the many, we've got the many talking to the many. And so now there's competing narratives, there's competing stories, there's competing realities. And I, I wonder again, post Westphalia here, I wonder if there is a way to rally everyone on the same story when everybody's getting all their own stories that they want. Everybody's getting their own narratives. People are doing their own research on everything. Um, it's a little deeper, more philosophical question, but like, do you think it's possible to rally the American people around a single truth like that? Especially when we take into account the fact that the schools have been corrupted. They're teaching our kids to hate the country. They're teaching our kids that we started all this in 1619 with the idea of preserving black slavery. Ah, how insane does that sound? Uh, so, what do you think about the lack of resonance? And by that, I mean people working in unison, uh, rallying around the same message, the lack of resonance in 2021 and beyond. And is it, is it even possible to think that we could, we could rally everyone on the same idea? I think in our current state, no, but I think that that that's going to be the fight trying to trying to educate people, bring them over to to our side or really just the, the side writ large that wants to care about the nation state and the American experiment that wants to preserve preserve that I think to use the World War Two example, you know, our, our grandfathers had to go and fight and many of them had to die in like actual physical kinetic combat. I don't think we're there right now. I, I think right now we're in this big information war where people like you and like I are like, we're, we're in this fight. We're in the mix. People see us out there and hopefully our, our courage is contagious and other people realize that they have to get out there and educate people in their own daily lives. Because right now, again, because of the media, all those cards are stacked against us. Most people don't want to, they don't want to engage because they don't want to get called a Nazi. Like they don't, you know, you know, you know, for well, it's not fun getting doxxed. It's not fun having someone say that, like, oh, I liked it better before, you know, Jack was a white supremacist. So there's a Twitter <laughs> account that says, like, Joe Kent's a fascist. Like, I laugh at it, but like, it's it's not cool. You know, I'm lucky that I am a little bit older. I, I'm established and like, that's not going to affect my, uh, the way I feed my family in the long run. But, and I know a lot of people aren't like that, but like, this is going to be the fight of our generation. And we're either going to pull it off or we're not going to pull it off. So I think really, getting that call to action, like, hey guys, there isn't gonna be some big moment where you get to just have one moment, one burst of courage, and mm -hmm. that's gonna be your your great moment, your great war. Like, we're in it right now. This is our generation's great war. I wish I could say that it was the global war on terror that I fought in and so many of my friends gave their lives in, um, but a lot of that was just setting the stage for where we are right now. I, I wish I could come back and kick back and say like the, the efforts I took overseas led to this great era of prosperity the way that the GI generation did. Um, but we're not it. Like this is it right now. This is the fight. So I, I think that, you know, it's a, it's a rallying call, but it's also like, Hey guys, like everybody's got to get up cause there's work to do. That's heavy, dude. That's heavy. That's heavy that, uh, our, our late, our great wars of the last 20 years didn't lead to the spillover positive commercial and societal effects that the war of, uh, of the world war two did. 
Uh, and in fact, that uh, all of our two trillion and twenty five hundred men and what forty thousand uh, casualties and and twenty years of time, that all all of that in Afghanistan was basically for nothing, except, yeah, except for not for nothing. It, it built and trained an apparatus that is going to directly lead to the harassment and the increase of the American people and the increase of tyranny in the United States. That is a very, very heavy and deep and sad thing to hear. And uh, when you just said that about your efforts and the sacrifices that you and your family made, the greatest sacrifices, um, not having been sort of the great battle, the great war that would make America great, et cetera. Um, you know, that made me sad, man. And uh, that, that's that really sucks. Um, but we got to we no, it, 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 go for it. Yeah. No, I mean, it, it does suck. The only good I think right now, and I'm sure some veterans will disagree with me and hate me all day long. The only good I think that can come from what just happened in Afghanistan, the tragic loss of 13 lives, watching that 20 years of lies come unravel. And we saw it before in Iraq, too. I mean, with that whole war was launched on lies and it's not over yet. What I think we can see from the global war on terror is that our government is lying to us. We, we the people, got nothing out of those wars, but a lot of our elites got rich. And a lot of the elites that didn't want to admit they were wrong, they were completely okay with lying, doubling and tripling down, sending more people off to die, spending trillions more dollars, giving China this massive strategic advantage. The list goes on. But seeing that in this modern media era where we can actually fact check them and not let them lie to us and then turn that scrutiny to other parts of our government, other parts of our system to say, hey, like, we know you guys are lying to us now and now we're going to do something about it. I think that that's the, the greatest outcome, the greatest thing that can come from what happened in the war on terror. Yeah. Um, I read an article by Josh Hammer, Josh Hammer, I think. I'm sorry if I got your name wrong, bud. Uh, in American Greatness recently where he said very clearly, he said, the, the hour is late. And the hour is late yeah. Uh, because of the technology, because of the potential for like a super AI, because of the corporate techno fascism that we see, because the White House has an office where they review social media posts that they flag for the social media companies to take down, where the White House has a coordinated list of people to be banned, not just from one social media platform, but from all of them in unison. When we realize that the hour is late, Maybe that will help motivate people a little bit to take the personal action that they need to take. And this is a battle that has to take place from the absolute most micro level all the way up into the national and global level. For the, for the micro level, that is about being a good family, being a good father, having a good, you know, creating a good family environment, teaching your sons to be masculine, teaching your daughters to be feminine, encouraging them to start families that have babies and to, to learn about the founding and to taking your education into your own hands. Um, there, there is a theme through the writers, through the, our leaders and our statesmen from, from Washington and Adams to Lincoln to Reagan, where, where we talk about a fervent patriotism, uh, a fervent reverence for the constitution, the declaration, the blood spilt in 1770s, uh, Lincoln called it a, po a political religion, uh, uh, Reagan, the, the phrase is escaping me, but he emphasized a return to basically loving America and fervent patriotism, uh, until we, until we have that again, I think we're going to have trouble rallying the masses. And I'm not sure how we get to the point where we can instill this fervent patriotism in people, this reverence for the documents, this reverence for the sacrifices that were made by the people at the time who put all of their lives and blood and treasure and family and the state and everything. Uh, I read a, I read a thread by the, uh, the redheaded libertarian the other day on Twitter, where she talked about the 56, I think, or 59 signers of the declaration and what happened to those guys. They all didn't have, you know, yeah. lives that lived happily ever after. You know, lots of them died mm -hmm. broke, destitute, poor, uh, house yeah. destroyed, family destroyed, wives captured by the British. You know, these people really yeah. made insane sacrifices so that we could live in this environment today where we've got people burning American flag and everybody cheering it and people burning Black Lives Matter flag and people going to jail for it. So I don't right. I don't understand how we're going to move too far into the future until we can re-engage with the American spirit. 
which is something that even when I was younger, you know, again, I was trained globalist, man. I, I had this idea that like engaging internationally and traveling all around the world and foreign corporations, all, I had an idea that this was like somehow sexy or the future, but man, have I, have I had in the last 10 years, you know, it's been a while now guys, but I've had, I've had a long time to understand. And now I really do believe that a, a fervent patriotism is essential teaching our children yeah. about the Republic and why we need it. And then teaching our children about what kind of people the Republic requires in order to function. What do you say to people who will hear what I just said? And maybe you agree with it or don't, but that the Republic, as John Adams said, requires a moral and virtuous people. And that we are no longer those moral and virtuous people. And when they hear people, they hear us say that, they say that we're, we're trying to raise a, a new Christian state in America. I'm not Christian. I wasn't baptized. I'm, I'm not Christian. I, I support Christianity. I, I, I'm becoming to believe a little bit. Uh, I've been reading the Bible. I'm very sympathetic to people of faith and belief. I, I may end up getting there soon. I feel it coming to me. But what do, what do we say to the people who are like, oh, you guys are trying to raise a white Christian nationalist nation here in response to us just being like, no, you need to be a good and virtuous people to uh, have a functioning republic. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I totally agree with you. I, I think there's um, there's a lot of folks who, who think that Christianity or, or traditional American values, Western values, are this thing in the past that we can move beyond, but then still somehow preserve the good things, the good parts, the freedoms of America. And you, you, I don't believe that you can have both of those at the same time. And I think we're really starting to see that because it's, it's getting up in people's faces. This, the more secular that we become, the more globalist that we become, the government wants more and more control. I mean, 2020 has been a great example of that. 2020 didn't slow down. Now in 2021, it's, you have to take the jab. You have to get the government prescribed vaccine whenever we tell you to because it's going to be multiple jabs now at this point and maybe potentially carry around your passport or you're going to lose your job like that that's what the globalist secular scientism like we we don't you know there's no faith in god there's only faith in those who are in particularly learned like fauci and we have to now worship them and whatever they say that's that's what the end result is there of uh this globalist and more secular way but the the christian values that we have and you can even be skeptical about the existence of God or like the history of the Bible, but really, I mean, again, quantifiable data. If you look at what the American experiment has been and what the Judeo-Christian West has brought humanity, it has been a very, very much a net positive. And, and the core beliefs there are that, hey, our rights come from God and not from man. Because the second you take that away, then men can start making other kinds of rules over what you do. Like the COVID example that I just used, or name it. I mean, we're going to get there. And then once that thing combines with technology, the amount of control that can have on you, if, if, if we surrender the sovereignty of God-given rights and that government exists to protect those rights, then the whole experiment is lost. So even if you don't believe in god christianity whatever the geo-christian way i think there's still a very compelling and strong case to be made for judeo-christian values and living by that code because that code right there gives you the utmost sovereignty over your own life and i and it's a it's a hard argument to have because like you said we've been hardwired i think in the the 80s and the 90s growing up that this new globalist way hey the the, the best part of our constitution is the separation of church and state that was i mean i was taught that in the 90s that's like the greatest thing ever and they give you all the examples of places where religion had kind of like overrun the government you're like oh yeah separation of church and state that's that's great but they skip the part where the whole reason that we have the state that allows us to separate the church from it is because of the judeo-christian values and believing again going back to that core principle that the purpose of our government and republic is to protect god-given rights so it's it's a hard fight. Again, this is where I really think that this is this is our fight. We have to be engaging. We have to have these arguments and these discussions with people and be open to people, you know, both calling us names, calling us fascists, um, but then also being willing to sit down and explain with people and not take that black pill and be like, well, I don't even I don't even talk to, to liberals or to leftists anymore because I just can't deal with them. Like, I'm sorry, man, we don't we don't we don't have that luxury. We have to go and talk to these people. We have to be persuasive. We have to do that hard work. Indeed. Uh I've been called a racist and a Nazi many times, but I recently was called Bible Thumper the other day. And uh, that was a that was a new one for me. That was a new one for me. And you know what? I I'm 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 ready to wear it. I'm really ready to wear it. Um 
I, I've been studying a lot about the founding. I've been reading the Bible. I've been reconnecting with my spiritual self. I've been praying to God. Uh, I don't know why or don't know how or whatever, but I'm just I'm just giving it a go. Uh, and uh, I've I've seen already like positive results in my life. I can't I can't deny it. Uh, it feels good. Um, and uh, it's it's connected me to these ideas that like human nature hasn't fundamentally changed in 5,000 years. You know, if you can go back, you can read Plato and Aristotle and they pretty much have like human nature nailed. And uh, then you, then you get the, the Bible and the same things. And here we are, you know, 2000 years later, thousands of years later, and we're still grappling with the same issues of human nature and uh, not to get too far into this, but it was my my coming to understand that everything around us has evolved. The earth has evolved. Science has evolved. Everything has evolved. We've discovered more things in space and math and whatever, but we haven't discovered is any fundamental change in human nature. And I was like, why am I, why is human nature not fundamentally changed? Oh, you know, I finally put it together the other day. God created man in his image. God isn't changing. Man, man isn't going to change. Human nature isn't going to change. Everything else around us is changing. So here I am like actually coming to this from reason, which is interesting for me because I've been very analytical about it. And I don't really know where I'm going with this, Joe. It's just two guys having a chat here. It's just like this, I think, is this conversation that, that I think a lot of people are having. Um, and then you, when it, it, the secularism, the decline in patriotism, the rise of all kinds of degeneracy and bad things in America, the praising of being obese and, and, and unhealthy, which directly led to the COVID, uh, you know, deaths all the, we're, we're literally teaching people to be sick so they can die. So we can shut down the economy and take people's jobs away and lock them up in their houses. You put all these things together and you, and you start like, oh, there, there actually may be a pretty elegant solution here that's been right in front yeah. of our faces the entire time, man. And are you, are you, I mean, uh, as Americans, I mean, as Americans, we love, we love sovereignty and freedom. And I mean, the more belief you have in God that you in this relationship with God are special and sovereign, that gives you like the most freedom. Everything else on the secular side I think is just driving you towards letting some other human have control of you. Like you said, like you just listen to everything the media says and they, they want you locked down. They want to praise you for being obese and they celebrate you whatever, whatever you're healthy at whatever weight. Um, but there's a huge corporate interest there, you know, behind that, that industry. And, and the same thing with everything that I feel like the secular side has to offer. Whereas if you are God fearing or you believe in God, however you want to look at that, it's between you and a relationship with God. And, and then again, you go back to like, hey, what's the point of this, this government? The government is to protect my God-given rights. And that gives that gives you an exorbitant amount of, of freedom, you know, especially freedom to raise your family and then to build a good, strong community. So that's that's one of the, I mean, that's one of the big reasons I, you know, consider myself a Christian and, and, a, and a believer. It's just, that's the ultimate sovereignty you have is that, you know, you're created in God's image and, and you can make a positive difference. You don't, you don't need some construct uh, of the media or of technology to tell you like how to be a good person. Yeah. Uh, when I was taught that the search up separation of church and state uh, was like the best thing about the government, uh, I always thought it was to protect the government from the church. I realize now it's actually to protect the church from the government, like keep the government out of our churches. Uh, and uh, that, that in of itself was just a mind, a mind shift. Uh, that I had to come to through experience and through negative consequences and like experiencing cognitive dissonance and not understanding why things in the world weren't lining up to my, my worldview. And I've just been grateful enough to have people like yourself and others where I can talk to them and, and talk through this. I basically been talking through this journey on my podcast. Now we're up to almost like episode number 80 and uh, you know, it's just been an evolution and I get to talk to these incredible people with these amazing insights and, and, uh, and just grow and evolve and learn. And I think that there are a lot of people with me on this same path. And uh, there was a moment where I thought the religious folks were just, just insane. And mostly I thought yeah. they were insane because I looked at them and they just had this like smile on their face. And I was like, man, how those people must be nuts. Those people must be weirdos. And now I'm like, yeah. Oh wait, I want that. <laughs> I right. want that smile. I want that peace. I want that serenity. Uh, it's really powerful. Um, one thing that you mentioned earlier that I would like to talk about before we get to the last issue here is you said that it wasn't going to be a one single moment of courage that was required, uh, but a sustained effort of courage. And now courage yeah. is 
is a manly, is a masculine trait. And of course, women can be courageous as well, but it certainly is a, is a masculine trait. Killing masculinity, the government hates masculinity, the feminists hate masculinity, which means they hate courage, which means they're telling our kids to be cowards and they're just telling us not to fight. And if you're afraid, oh, it's okay. Like, listen to that fear. <laughs> or if you're uncomfortable in class when they're talking about white supremacy, then good, just sit with it, disconnect your sense of fear and uncomfort. How and when do we reinstill a sense of courage in our young men in America? I think we have to start it now as young as as young as you possibly can, really. I mean, I think that, you know, getting over some of the, the hovercraft parent or helicopter parent, whatever you want to call it, instincts of trying to nerf all the edges for your kids, I think is big. Um, you know, unfortunately, because of uh, my wife being killed in combat, I, I had to have discussions about death and war with very young kids. Um, and I hope I did that right. Something I ask myself every day if I if I did it right. But really, it, it's it's reality and, it, and it's up in our face. So I, I don't think that sugarcoating things and I don't think, you know, protecting them, we have to protect them from the world so they can they can be nurtured and they can grow up and be strong. But I think we have to tell them that, hey, your job as a man is to go and defend your family. It is to be courageous and here's what courage look like looks like. It's it's speaking out when you see something that's wrong and even in some cases taking action. And, and I mean channeling that that uh, that unchecked male aggression I think is something that's that's very challenging. But if you completely ignore it and you say that every single part of male aggression is toxic and horrible and it has to be suppressed, man it's going to come out some way. It's going to come out some way, shape or form. And chances are, if you didn't channel it in the right places, it's going to come out. And then you're actually going to see true toxic masculinity because these poor young men are not going to have an outlet. And we've done, our society has done a number on every single institution that's supposed to provide that outlet to channel masculinity from, you know, combat sports to even watching, you know, GI Joe cartoons, comic books, whatever. Um, and then bigger institutions like the Boy Scouts, the military, law enforcement. I mean, I spent 20 years in the military. I always say I'd go back and do it all over again. I, I had such a great experience. It was such the right thing for me to do. But now I look at what they're doing to the military and I'm like, man, I, I, I thank God every day that I was lucky that I was, I was 18 years old in 1998 and got to join the army then, not right now, because I don't know what, what would I have done? What would 18 year old me have done? I mean, I probably would have joined anyways, but like it wouldn't have been the same experience. And I don't know what would have happened to me at that point. And I think there's, generation of men that have just not had that outlet so i think we have to again we have to rebuild a lot of these institutions like what you're doing i think we have to take the boy scouts back over that's something that i want to do as my boys get a little bit older and then we have to demand the same things from our military institutions from police force so again it's one of those things that i i wish there was one simple answer to but it's just going to be a grind and i think we're going to end up having lots of you're going to end up having to do a lot of pers persuasion with uh people that are in your, in your boys' lives from the schools to the athletic coaches and, and all that. Indeed. Uh, strong fathers are what's required here, folks. Strong fathers that have an idea of what it even means to be masculine so you can teach your son, teach them virtues and values, whether it's, it's all of the above. People giving me crap about saying that baseball is, I thought, the only place that my son can learn virtue and honor and courage. Like, come on, guys. It's a whole repertoire here. We talk about it at home at the dinner table. We talk about it every time we're out in public and something happens or there's a good example. And I put him in sports so that he can learn how to work with other people right. and be courageous in front of a crowd of folks and face your fears and overcome your challenges. And uh, it is going to take a holistic effort. It is going to take a holistic effort. We're going to need more people with courage. We're going to need more people willing to stand up. And now speaking of this, let's get to the last segment that I had planned here. What is going on with Marine Lieutenant Colonel Stuart Scheller? Uh, I, this story yeah. is, is like blowing my mind. Uh, Joe, talk us through it and your perspective on it and what you would do if you were in Congress and what can we do right now to actually help this guy? Yeah, so Lieutenant Colonel uh, Stuart Shelley, he's a Marine Lieutenant Colonel infantryman, uh, served about 17 years. I think he's done multiple combat deployments, as far as I know. Um, after the 13 Marines were killed during the, the botched uh, withdrawal from Afghanistan, he made a very viral, I think it was like a LinkedIn video, but a very viral video he put on social media. It was just him in uniform um, saying, hey, 
I demand accountability. There's been multiple lies. There was a botched withdrawal plan that got these 13 Marines killed. It was his old battalion. He had since moved on, but he was in that battalion. So he was still connected to many of the Marines, I believe. He said, hey, I, I want accountability for these guys getting killed, but I also want accountability for all the lies you know, throughout the years that got us to this point. Like I basically, I'm mad as hell and I won't take it anymore. He said, like, I've, you know, I've been fighting for 17 years and for it to just end this way, we can't just move on. Like th there has to be accountability. And he was demanding accountability, um, not from necessarily politicians and not from like the American people. He was directly saying to the military chain of command, I want accountability from you. And for non-military people, uh, Lieutenant Colonel is an 05. Uh, in, his, in his own little world, he's a powerful person, but in the grand scheme of things at the Pentagon, he's a coffee boy. Like he's, he's not a high ranking guy. I don't say that to demean him, but at, at, he's essentially a grunt in the grand scheme of like the corporate ladder. Um, so he was the lowest ranking guy and the, or actually not the lowest ranking guy, he was the senior person that called for accountability. I mean, the, the central command, general, four-star general, really just kind of completely shrugged off the whole incident. He said, yeah, well, sometimes we lose people when we're doing these kind of operations. We sort of figured this was going to happen. Anyways, moved on to the next thing. We all know the backstory on General Milley. Milley had, he, he accepts no accountability whatsoever for how things went. And then he tries to deflect and, you know, goes and talks to Bob Woodward. Woodward's book comes out about how he was undermining Trump. And that's is supposed to give Milley a pass for, you know, colluding with the Chinese government and then handing over this base. So really the biggest, the bottom line with Scheller is that he is the only person in uniform as an 05 grunt that has demanded any kind of accountability, not just for what happened in Kabul with the botched withdrawal, but the only person in uniform who's demanded accountability for really, I would say the Afghan war in the global war on terror at large. And so since then, he has been, um, he actually asked to just leave the military. Uh, at the military, in the military, you get, you do 20 years, you get a pension. Uh, he was willing to cash out at 17 years and say like, I will resign right now. I want accountability. I'll throw it all on the table and I'll walk. He has to do that. And then since then, the Marine Corps has silenced him. They've actually detained him and put him in the brig or, or military jail. He can't communicate with the outside world and he is waiting some sort of, uh, I guess, judicial hearing. Do you have any idea what the charges are or what the justification is for putting him in some sort of confinement here? Putting, there's no justification for putting him in confinement. So him getting in uniform and making a political statement, that's against the UCMJ. Um, but it has, but it's one of those policies that has not been uniformly enforced. I mean, there's been other service members who've done very similar things. Um, but, you know, usually they were saying something against a Republican or saying something against Trump. And there was like no repercussions whatsoever. At about a week before Scheller made his video, there was a uh, female service member who was talking about, hey, if martial law is declared, she's going to have no issues with shooting conservative Americans who won't listen to her. You know, and she was in uniform making these statements. Um, so she essentially did the exact same thing Scheller did. As far as I know, no disciplinary action has been taken against her. Um, I, it, but it's, it's, a, it's such a minor charge that people don't get detained for this. I've never heard of anybody being detained for this. So like, the only people that get detained in the military, it's kind of like the civilian world. Like you, you did some act of physical violence where they deem that you're dangerous, or, or, you know, a threat to yourself or to others. So they're, they're definitely going above and beyond to shut this guy up because he's dangerous. I mean, I, I'd encourage people to go watch his, the first video that he made. He does a really good job of laying out why he wants accountability and, and where he thinks a lot of the blame lies. You could argue that uh, Milley did exactly the same thing by making political statements and taking things into his own hands in the uniform. Yeah. No one is getting him detained. Uh, he hasn't been arrested. Yeah. He's not going to be prosecuted. Um, it reminds me of the fact that in my local area here, a uh, high school coach was just arrested for child sexual abuse of a secondary student, meaning he was having sex with his students. Okay. They arrested him and released him back into the community the very same day. Okay. A child sexual predator was processed and put outside the doors, put back in the community in a matter of hours. And we've got a guy like Lieutenant Colonel Scheller here who is being detained for just speaking out on behalf of truth, justice, and accountability. And then we've got January 6 protesters who have been in solitary confinement, some of them for nine months now. Joe Biggs, Joe Biggs is in, is in jail 
for going to the Capitol building. And then you got Millie being openly traitorous. Is that a word? Traitorous? I don't know. <laughs> being an open <laughs> traitor. Being an open traitor yeah. and uh, not suffering any consequences. So, you know, I, I think if you're doing a black pill, white pill tally, this definitely goes in the black pill column. But it's also one yes. one extra set of motivations to just keep going and to yeah. to 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 engage in what you you called very aptly a sustained courageous effort, not just single moments uh, of courage. And that's a heavy uh, that's a heavy weight, you know. That's a lot to carry around for people. Uh, sustained acts of courage. You you think. Uh, perhaps that maybe you're going to just be afraid and have to act with courage in sporadic moments, but right. where we are today right now, uh, and the trajectory, again, if you just keep plotting the points on the graph and you just draw that line, it's pretty clear where things are going as, as unsavory yeah. or evil, let's just call it that as it will be. Uh, the idea of, of sustaining courageous effort can be very tiring. It can be enough to make you want to check out. Uh, right. But uh, guys, you can't do it. Women, you can't do it. Grind. You got to grind. We got to grind. And uh, as long as there's more Joe Kent's coming, uh, which you're one of a kind, sir, but I do believe that there are others uh, that can fill, there definitely are. fill in behind you. Um, I see you're meeting up with uh, Anthony Sabatini from Florida coming up. That's mm -hmm. pretty awesome. I, oh, yeah. I, re I really like Anthony quite a bit. Uh, there, there are there are more people coming. There, there are more and more people coming over uh, the wall onto this side uh, than ever before. We've seen it in the media figures. We've seen it with intellectuals. We've seen it uh, as a result of the COVID response. Um, you start stacking up COVID and the financial crisis and the war on terror and all these things. And you start to realize that our experts don't actually know anything. In fact, they're malicious actors and they're coming for you and your kids yeah. and your wallet and your freedom that, you know, unfortunately the way that we produce more people on our side is through loss and suffering. Yep. And, uh, and we're seeing that, uh, traumatic events are usually what it takes for people to shake free of an ideology that has captured them. And that's what's happened to most people on the left. We all know people who five years ago were normal, sane, reasonable folks who now in the last five years have become absolutely insane. Uh, and it's going to take a whole effort from top to bottom. Joe, you're on your way uh, to Congress. You have my support. You have all the support of our listeners for sure. Uh, and it's going to take all the way down to the, to the very micro level. And that's what I'm doing with the liminal order, guys. If you believe in everything that we're talking about here, if you believe in the power of masculinity, if you believe in the power of brotherhood, I know, I know Joe Kent knows what masculinity and brotherhood do. Sure. And, you, and you believe in the power of sovereignty, then come join us in the liminal, liminal order, liminal-order.com. Doors are open actually right now. We're almost at 800 members worldwide. We're not just an email list. It's not just a bunch of names on, on, a, on a page somewhere. We're real-life men doing real-life things, having real-life impacts, starting businesses, taking initiative, building things, building a brotherhood, building a community, building an economy, building an economy inside the network. So join us, liminal-order.com. And on a lighter note, join us at Jack Brunch. Okay. Cause we need fellowship. We right. need to just get out there and have fun. Yeah, we are doing a, a nationwide tour. We're coming to Seattle, I believe in January. Hopefully we uh -oh. can, hopefully we can see you, Joe. That would be amazing. Yeah, that'd be awesome. it, it is a Sunday brunch. It starts at one o'clock. So people will have time to go to church. Come, come to us afterwards yeah. for some fellowship, break bread, drink some wine, meet some cool people. We've done one in New York and in Chicago already. They were huge hits. We've got one coming up in Tampa. We're going to Austin. We're going to Nashville. We're going to Denver. We're going to LA area, Orange County. Cause of course we're not going to LA, uh, San Francisco area as well. So come out and join us there. Uh, follow us on Twitter at Jack brunch, go to the website, jackbrunch.com. You need fellowship. We need all these things. We need to train our kids. We need to have fellowship and find friendship and community. We need to attack. Nope. You're going to take that word back. We need to uh, make a make a big effort to get into Congress and to, and to, and to make changes. <laughs> make changes in Congress. And uh, Joe Kent and the America Force guys, a lot of guys working with Matt Brainerd. I hope that's going well. Yeah. Um, a true Absolutely. patriot, a true patriot there as well. So Joe, where can people find you? How can we get you some more support? How can we get you some more money? What can we do? What can people do to help your cause, bud? 
Jim Kent for Congress is where you find find everything. You can find more information about me, where I'm going to be in the district, and then obviously the campaign donations are huge. So we're we're running off all small donations right now. We're beating the incumbent two to one individual uh, contributions. Our average contribution is like fifty three dollars, which is amazing. So people donating five, ten, fifteen bucks like really helps us push back against the establishment and and really just take our country back. So Joe Kent for Congress dot com is where they find that. Links to all my social media on there as well. Excellent. I've seen your social media blowing up uh, when we first started talking. You were just yeah. getting started. Now you're blowing up. You got yeah. a national voice. I do believe that the way part of the way to win local elections is to have a national presence so that you can be more powerfully effective for the people in your district. This is not about becoming a rock star. This is not about setting the stage for some future presidential run. The actual way to become more effective local leader is to have a national platform so that you can have national attention. You can have more support behind you. Um, Maybe we should talk to our friends, JD and Blake about uh, where they're getting some of their money so we can help augment some of your efforts. I wonder where they're getting their money from. I don't have any idea where they're getting that money from. Maybe we can work on that. Joe, thank you so much. I appreciate it. Everybody in the chat. Thank you very much guys on the audio podcast. Thank you for listening. Even though as we do these things live on YouTube, follow me on Twitter at Jack Murphy live, Jack brunch, liminal order, all the things. Joe Kent, thank you very much, man. I'm going to take these guys out, and uh, I will talk to you very soon. All right? Thank you. Awesome, brother. Thank you so much, Jack. Appreciate it. My pleasure, Joe. Any time. On this show, we're driven by curiosity. We want to chart a path forward. Best people, best conversations. We're on a journey, and it's just getting started. 